Hey, squirrel. Sorry it's taking me a while, and I'm wearing the same old thing because my brother hadn't gotten all my clothes out of the van yet. Hopefully you will soon. Chapter 12. Since Grams and I don't know a great deal about narwhal tusks or their potential use in magic and alchemy, I opt to call in the big guns. Unfortunately, Silas is otherwise engaged. He promises to pick up donuts and coffee from Bless, bless You in the morning and delve into a deeper Rory Bombay discussion at that time. Piwacket is deeply disturbed by the recovered relic and circles warily around the coffee table. In the end, he takes up a position atop the wardrobe and sleeps with one eye open. I've had all the excitement I can stand for one day, and a long hot bath with one of my new rainbow bath bombs is just what the doctor ordered. Or would be if doctors gave orders for, spe for spectacular soaks. Tongue tied. I'll search for that book while you're luxurating in the tub, dear. The unicorn horn reference has a real ring of familiarity. One of the secretive arms of the rare book's mezzanine must contain what I'm looking for. If I can't find it tonight, you can text Twiggy in the morning. Copy that, Grams, and to make sure we're all on the same page, there's no popping in the bathroom while I'm luxurating in the tub. Capisce? Grams throws a sparkling hand to her forehead and pops a salute. Aye, aye, Captain. Oh, brother. I grab my warmest pajamas, thick as socks, and my robe. Piwaka continues to feign sleep from his perch high atop the antique furniture. Splendid steam fills the bathroom and the wall heater hums to life. This has to be the coziest space in all of Pincherry Harbor. The bath bomb emits a warm, spiced apple fragrance as it circles around the bathtub, sputtering its rainbow trail. Eventually, we get to the end of the rainbow, and I slip into the delicious liquid. Resting my head against the soft, air-filled pillow suction to the back edge, I replay the incidents at the antiquity shop to see if I can collect any extra sensory information about the suspicious events in the back room. Starting the memory clip with my hand on the front door, there's a strange flash of familiarity. I can't discern whether it's the place or a person, but it's worth noting. There are two or three items on the character carefully lit shelves that draw my attention as I walk through the psychic recall. They scream, stolen. First good coffee I've had in forever since I was at my house. Still a brother butts. No surprise there, I fast forward to the moment when the pretty southern belle steps behind her desk to check her inventory. The left hand shuffles papers while the right hand slips out of sight. The extrasensory replay allows me to zoom in and confirm that she indeed presses a button. The light blinks on and off in the back room. I hadn't noticed that in the shop, but this tidbit supports my suspicion that she was alerting someone to my presence. Fast forward to me searching the shelves and desk in the storage area. There's that sound. I rewind the scene with all my inexplicable perceptions engaged. The replay reveals that the sound is definitely the shuffling slide of a foot. The energy is twisted in some way, almost as if it's masked. For me, that's authentication enough. Who else would be hiding in the back room of Bombay Antiquities and cowering behind a magical shield? Allowing myself to slip under the water, I release the replay as the heat and fragrance envelop me. Envelop me. Silas will know what to do tomorrow. Tonight's program includes relaxation, recharging, and reheating. If you say reheating sweet and sour chicken, I'll find a way to ghost vomit. I shoot out of the water like a surfacing submarine. Grams! 
the ghostly form has its back turned for what it's worth. I'm sorry, dear. I know I broke the rules, but I found the book and I can't manage enough physical substance to pull it from the shelf. So when you're done in here, oh, I'm done. Trust me, relaxation obliterated. I lift the drain plug and scowl. Ski daddle so I can at least dress in peace. Thank you, dear. You're a treasure. Ghost puke. Ghost vomit. Flattery will get you nowhere, you peeping ghost, she snorts as she vanishes through the wall. Out on the elegantly curved left arm of the mezzanine that long ago surrounded the huge brewing vats that were part of this historical distillery, I slide the ladder across the shelving to the point where Grams is bouncing up and down like a toddler who's OD'd on birthday cake. It's, it's here. It's right here. See? Unicorn magic of the Norse. I climb carefully up the ladder, not wanting a repeat of the fall that could have killed me several months ago, but that's another story. Reaching the shelf where Grams is anxiously, anxiously pointing, I toy with her for a minute. Is it this book? This one right here? Her pointing finger becomes a fist and lands on her curvy hip. Don't you get smart with me, young lady. Laughing at my own joke, I retrieve the book and slowly back down the ladder. <clears throat> the tales prove less enthralling than the title led me to believe, and I'm shocked awake when the voice of Silas Willoughby crackles over the apartment's intercom. I drifted off so quickly last night that the reality of daylight leaves me confused. And disoriented, surprisingly, I'm still holding the book of unicorn lore, or rather bore. Coming. He can't hear you until you push the button, dear. Graham's gestures toward the wall. Not being a morning person, I glower and snap. Thanks, Vasco da Gamma. <laughs> I've had the intercom orientation. I put on a false voice and recite the and the mother of pearl inlaid buttons are the way to respond. The one on the left lets you talk, and the one on the right is the call button to ring the back room. The middle rings the museum. Grams crosses her arms and tiss. You'd better adjust your attitude before Silas gets up here. He won't tolerate sass. <laughs> her ass. I push the button on the left and attempt some congeniality. Come on up, Silas. I'm desperate for donuts. Ghost my Snickers behind me. You should put that on a t-shirt. Pushing the plaster medallion above the intercom, I turn as the bookcase door slides open for Silas. I deserve that. Sorry for snapping at you. You know me and early. Grams crosses her bejeweled limbs and lifts her chin, vindicated at last. Silas enters with a large box of pastries and two steaming cups of java. Yeah, mine's at the bottom, certainly isn't steaming. I don't have attention, I don't have a short attention span. I just, oh look, a squirrel. So cute. Cold. Early form. Da, 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 da. Places everything on the coffee table and takes his favorite chair as I lunge for a cup of black gold as though it's the anecdote, antidote to a poison. He speaks while I glug. I uncovered a plethora of alarming facts. How did your research? How did your research progress? Grams laughs openly at his query, and both of us glance toward the open book peeking out from under the folds of the down comforter. Not that great. I take another glorious sip of coffee before I continue. I kind of nodded off, but in my defense, it was the most boring book in the history of ever. He carefully chews his pastry and politely wipes Bavarian cream from the corner of his mouth. Which text put you to sleep? Something about Norse unicorn horns. Silas nods. Ah, yes. A fanciful attempt to disguise the truth. Once the myth of the unicorn horn had been put into play, narwhal tusk. 
escalated rapidly in value, there would have been little benefit to hunters to correct the inaccuracy. My bottom lip juts out in a mock pout. So you're not about to tell so you're not about to tell me that unicorns are real? Because with all the ghosts and stuff, I was really hoping for unicorns. Silas chuckles and reaches for a second pastry. I wish for it as well. However, in the long years of my life, I've never had the pleasure to prove or disprove that myth. There are yet places in the world I have not visited. Perhaps one day his musings are terminated by a mouthful of a clear. Graham's rockets down from the ceiling in frustration. I think the two of you have had enough to eat. Let's get down to business. Why is Rory Bombay after that unicorn horn, horn chalice? She gestures violently toward the relic next to the donuts. Yikes, for your information, Grams is getting a little pushy. I think we better wrap up breakfast and get down to the deets. Silas smooths his mustache. I'm not familiar with deets. Is this a relatively new author? author? The burst of laughter that erupts through my mouth carries a small puff of powdered sugar along for the ride. Uh, no, it's short for details. All this time at college has affected my vocabulary. Silas harumps, not for the better, I see. You're not wrong. My time with arcane text proved quite valuable. The chalice was carved from a, nar from a narwhal tusk. The stem and ornate base were crafted from iron ore extracted from a meteor. The symbol on the cup is indeed the mark of the goddess Freya. So why does Rory want it? Certainly not to tran <coughs> certainly not to transmute poison. It was proven in the 1600s that Norwal tusk, then known as unicorn horn, did not possess any properties of merit in that arena. So what's he after? It's far more likely the power of this cup is linked to the something. S-E-I-O-R. Magic instilled by the high priestess of Freya. According to my research, it's believed that this vessel once held the power of illusion. Perhaps it plays into a scheme of Mr. Bombay's to conceal himself from authorities. I reach for a third donut, but Ghost Ma's gasp forces my hand back to my lap. So he drinks something from this cup and becomes invisible? Silas tilts his head back and forth slowly, in a manner of speaking. It would be a complicated transmutation resulting in an intricate delusion. Intricate delusion. I do not believe Mr. Bombay possesses the skill. However, he is delving deeper into these murky secrets that I would deem safe. Do you mean he could get sick like what happened to Grams? She sputters with offense. Look here, young lady, I wasn't devouring mystical texts <clears throat> in search of supreme power. I arch an eyebrow and translate for Silas. He leans back and chuckles. I had no intention of impugning your reputation, Isadora. There was no malice in your search for knowledge. <clears throat> Perhaps you were a bit greedy and depleted your body faster than it could replenish. It's not a judgment. It's simply the truth. Sadness and regret vibrate my grandmother's apparition. She floats through the wall without a word. She didn't argue, but she did leave. Understandable. Picking up the chalice, I turn it in my hand and trace the gentle swirl of the unicorn horn. Do these whales still exist? Narwhals are severely endangered. Apart from the Inuit peoples, no one is permitted to hunt them in this day and age. This cup may, in fact, have powerful magical properties, but it's also worth a veritable fortune. Wow, I gingerly set the chalice on the coffee table. We must protect it and see that, it is, that it's gifted to a museum for proper display. Sure, whatever you recommend. 
I'm not really comfortable owning something made from an endangered species. Indeed. Should I go back to the antiquity shop and confront Rory? Salas leans into the overstuffed chair and laces his fingers over his paunch. That would be ill-advised. One man is already dead. I believe we're unco we've uncovered a probable motive. I'll continue my research here in the loft. Tomorrow we shall see what we can pry from the lips of the defenders. Perhaps today you can visit Mr. Harper and update him as you see fit. Am I giving any of this information to Paulson? Perhaps it's time to hand off the negative. A gesture of goodwill should keep her on our side. Copy that. Silas return, retires to the loft to page through history while I shove a judgment-free third donut in my mouth and finish my coffee. Down at the station, Paulson is in an uncharacteristic foul mood, even for her. Hey, deputy, I found something that may or may not help the case. She scowls up from the mountain of paperwork on Eric's desk. Look, Moon. I don't have time for hunches. The evidence against Harper is stacking up. She leans back and sighs heavily, and despite what you think, I don't like that. I nod and pull a small envelope from my coat pocket. This negative was recovered from Professor Klang's office. Not sure if it will help, but it appears to depict some Norse artifacts. Maybe he was engaged in some black market trading. It's a potential lead. Pawson takes the negative. Okay, I'll get this over to the lab and get a print made. She puts me, she puts one of her punch, pudgy hands on the telephone and pauses. Thanks. No problem. We both want the same thing, right? She nods and picks up the receiver. That's my cue. I exit the office and walk toward the holding cells. The heaviness in my heart is sure to affect the expression on my face. As my hand rests on the door handle, I attempt to access some positive access, some positive energy reserves, and paste a smile on my frustrated face. Harper, you awake? I brought donuts. His sexy fingers reach through the bars and grip the cold gray metal. This promises to be the highlight of my day, Moon. I smile and pass the donuts through the bars. My eyes widen as I take in the redecorated cell. First, it's prisoner makeover day, and now it looks like an episode of While You Were Out. What's going on in here, Harper? His cheeks redden and he rolls his eyes. You would be looking at the efforts of holding cell interior designer Gracie Harper. His mama. He sits on the metal bench now covered by a small mattress. <clears throat> and a handmade quilt. Your mom is a pistol. If you're in here much longer, she's liable to paint a mural on that back wall. <laughs> the smile on his face is everything. You have no idea. Given Eric's history with Rory Bombay, I, I keep the update to the 35 millimeter negative and a possible connection to black market artifact artifacts. Uh, he nods, but I can feel his desire to jump into this investigation. I'll stop by after school tomorrow and let you know if Silas and I get any more info from the students. He sits down his pastry and walks to the bars. His hand reaches through and brushes the snowy hair from my face. It's nice to see the real Mitzi, too. His kind words stir my heart and my cheeks flush a self-conscious shade of pink. Thanks, Sheriff. He presses against the barrier and pecks my cheek. Keep saying that. It gives me hope. That one little phrase keeps me toasty warm all the day back to the bell book and candle, despite the howling winds and threatening clouds. The remainder of my Sunday fun day is frittered away listening to Silas drone on about narwhals and unicorn horns. No smoking gun is revealed and we opt for calling it a day and hoping for a breakthrough tomorrow. And that's it for chapter 12. Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be happy. Bye-bye.